So there are revisions coming to the NIH peer review process for applications submitted next year in 2025. Some of these changes will affect how applications are reviewed and some of the changes will reflect both the review of the application and how the applications are structured. It depends on the application type. So we thought it would be appropriate to um, alert the community to these changes. And to that end, Sarah Whelan, who is an SRO at NHGRI's review branch, will give an overview of the coming revisions to peer review. Okay, hello. Um, so I'm, as Rudy said, an SRO with the review branch, um, and I'm talking to you now because I'm also the um, NHGRI uh, coordinator for the uh, uh, simplified review framework. So my job is to go to the meetings and understand all of the details of these and communicate them to NHGRI and to the broader community. Um, so there are many changes coming up in 2025 to NIH applications and review. So here's a summary of the changes. Most of these are happening January 25th, 2025. That's the, um, the target date. Um, some of them are happening a little bit later in the spring. Um, so the first thing that's changing is the simplified review framework for most research project grants is going to be implemented. I'm gonna talk about that in more detail. Um, there are also improvements coming to the fellowship application and review process. Along with those, there's updated reference letter guidance. This is for the fellowship applications. Um, there are also updated updates to the training grant applications. Um, updated application forms. This will be forms I. We're currently using forms H. Um, these are just the forms that come along with the application packages. Um, forms I will be released later this year, um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Also, the biosketch and other support forms uh, will be changing, um, so that we'll be using the forms used by um, the rest of the federal agencies um, with some changes to accommodate some of the things that NIH wants to know about. Um, and you can learn many more details about all of these at the um, website there. I don't have that again on the last slide, um, but it should be easy to find. It just changes coming January 2025. Okay, so the first thing that I'll talk about is the simplified review framework. And so these are changes to the review criteria, um, and these should not affect the applications. So the applications for these should be the same, but the critiques and summary statements will be affected. Um, these changes are intended to reduce focus on the investigator and institution and also to, review, to reduce reviewer burden. And importantly, the notices of funding opportunities will be reissued um, to reflect these changes. Um, so there's going to be a transition and people are going to have to pay attention to which notice of funding opportunity that they're applying for. Um, and it affects all of the activity codes listed there. Um, it is, uh, most of the research applications, notably the U24 applications, which is the activity code often used by NHGRI, is not affected. That will be under the old review framework. Um, so the changes coming are intended to enable peer review reviewers to focus on important questions. So should the re re research be conducted and can it be conducted? Um, and to reduce the effect of reputational um, bias, um, there are also changes to reduce reviewer burden. Um, so the five review, review criteria are going to be reorganized into three factors. Um, some of the additional review criteria, such as the human subject inclusion criteria and study timelines for clinical trials, um, will be moved to one of these factors. I'll show you the next slide what these factors are. Um, and the investigator and environment will be evaluated very simply, just as sufficient or gaps identified. Um, and this will be considered in the overall impact score, but will not receive an individual criterion score. And uh, most of the additional review considerations will no longer be peer reviewed, but will be shifted to NIH staff to review. And so the five criteria that you're all familiar with um, will be reorganized into three factors. And the first factor is importance of the research. 
and this is um, significance and innovation. And this will still receive a score from one to nine, which we're all familiar with. Um, the second factor is rigor and feasibility. Um, and so this is pretty much the approach. Um, and again, this, this will also include um, all of the inclusion criteria for human subjects as well as the study timeline. Um, this will also receive a score from one to nine, criterion score. Um, and the third factor is expertise and resources. And so this pretty includes everything you're familiar with um, dealing with the investigator and environment. This will just have a drop down um, by binary, um, appropriate or gaps identified. And if the reviewer chooses gaps identified, then there's a text box where they can explain um, what gaps they've seen. Um, and this will not receive an individual score, um, but the reviewer's opinion of this can be factored into the overall impact score. Um, and so the uh, changes to reduce reviewer burden is that the, the um, additional review considerations um, the review of three of these, including the resource sharing plan, will be shifted to the NIH staff. So reviewers will only have to um, look at the authentication of key biologicals and the budget, and um, the others will be reviewed by staff. Um, and so there is quite a bit more information on, the, on these, including you know, description of the changes, guidance for reviewers, notices and reports, um, frequently asked questions, contacts, and links to um, uh, public webinars that are scheduled, um, all on this site, which is linked to from the overall um, changes coming in January 2025 site. Um, so there are also revisions coming to fellowship applications and review. Um, these are coming after many discussions at NIH, some of them actually spearheaded by our own Betty Graham. Um, and these will be changes, these affect both the application structure and review. And the changes are intended to focus on a candidate's scientific potential and research training plan. Um, and this is meant to make sure that reviewers recognize a broad range of candidates in research training context as meritorious. And these notices of funding opportunities are also going to be reissued to reflect these changes. And this affects the F activity codes, the fellowship activity codes. This is not the K training grants. Those are actually not being affected by any of these changes. These are the fellowship applications. Um, and importantly, if an application was submitted under the old criteria and is resubmitted after January 25th, 2025, that application will have to be restructured um, for the, the new application um, criteria. Um, so the um, aims of this whole initiative are to focus reviewer and, and attention on the candidate's preparedness and potential um, and the research training plan, but importantly, the potential of the research training plan to develop the candidate into an independent researcher. Um, and then reviewers will also be focused on the commitment to the candidate. Um, and these are, again, meant to recognize a broad range of candidates in research training contests. Um, and it's intended to reduce bias in review um, by emphasizing the sponsor's commitment to the candidate and not so much the, the, the sponsor's in, 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 orga, in institution um, reputation. Um, and so this will apply to applications submitted for due dates after 20, January 25th, 2025, which is the, the April um, 2025 review date, uh, due date. Um, so the um, candidate criteria um, um, were going to encompass a wider range of scientific potential preparedness um, and this uh, will help identify promising scientists. Um, and the research training plan will be evaluated as a, um, as a training vehicle um, for the candidate. Um, and the sponsor evaluation and institutional evaluation will de-emphasize the track record and again emphasize their contributions to the candidate's training plan. Um, and the application is shorter and more structured um, and there's less emphasis on the sponsor's track record. Um, and it's better defined who is supposed to be authoring each section. 
and coming up and coming along with all of this are updated reference letter instructions. So the current fellowship review headings are be reorganized and condensed um, into just three. Uh, one is the candidate preparedness and potential, and then the research training plan and the commitment to the candidate. And for the fellowships, there are no changes to the additional review criteria or additional review considerations. And so all of the, those, those extra um, factors will, be, will stay the same. So the um, applicant instructions are changing. So the applicant section is now um, uh, uh, renamed the candidate section. The intent here is to clarify the difference between candidate, who was the person applying, and the applicant, which is actually the institution. Um, and so this section is intended to be written by the candidate. Um, and grades are no longer required or actually even allowed, um, which uh, may be very helpful to some candidates. Um, and candidates will uh, uh, submit a few personal statements, including the, um, their goals, qualifications, self-assessment, and scientific perspective. There's also a research training plan section. This is, again, supposed to be written by the candidate. Um, and the headings of some sections have been renamed. Um, and the, this, uh, these sections include um, what's listed below, the training activities, um, project aims, the um, strategy, and this includes the scientific foundation and rationale. Um, the third section is supposed to be written by the sponsor and co-sponsors, and they're submitting several statements outlining their commitment to the candidate and commitment to the candidate's training plan. Um, and there's an um, extra statement that will, will be required if there's some um, clinical training involved. And so the, there's a public webinar about the revisions to the fellowship application and review process. This information is again linked to from that main overall site of all the changes coming in January 2025. Um, the last thing is um, updates to training grant applications. Um, so the data tables are going to be updated to reduce applicant and reviewer burden. The main change here is to clarify who gets listed in the data tables. Um, and these, these actually should be pretty greatly condensed. Um, and another important change is that the plan for training and responsible conduct of research and the recruitment plan to enhance diversity will both contribute to the overall impact score. Um, and these changes are intended to define expectations for mentor training. Also, um, the range of positive career outcomes will be clarified. Um, these changes affect uh, T32s and also other activity codes, including some of our R25s that use these tables. Uh, there's a public webinar on June 5th. There's the link to it, but this link is also on the page of all of the changes in January 2025. And so there are detailed explanations, links to frequently asked questions, the guide notices, the guide notice for the training Grant changes is not out yet, but it should be any day. Um, and links to public webinars for all of these changes is at this URL. And that is it. If you have any questions, um, I'm happy to try to answer them. Takar. So who reviews the human subjects protection? Um, um, is that the reviewers, or is that uh, extramural? The um, the human subject protection that is that is going to be that's still the reviewers, but it will not be in a scored factor. It will be an additional review um, right. criteria. Right. I mean, so. typically it's not scored, but it's um, it's not the response. It's still the responsibility of the reviewer. Yes. Yes. And then, are th what is an example of a U twenty four? You said. That's not affected by these changes. Can you give us? Yes. Yeah. So those are um, some of the bigger um, collaborative agreement consortium um, grants, and so and those are not those sure. will not be affected. Yeah. And the Ks are not affected as well. The Ks are not affected. There's um, no current timeline to update. The, so you'll the still have the five, and each of yes. them will be scored. Yes. Thank you. 
Just a quick comment. I really want to thank you for uh, simplifying the data tables. That will be a welcome. <laughs> that yes. will be welcome, not just by the applicants, but I suspect by the reviewers. Yes, yes. I think that was a long-awaited change. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. Casey. Um, so I was just wondering if the the total score is going to change. So maybe the like triage process and not discuss cutoff might change. Is that something well, actually, that's come they up? They do not anticipate that the range of scores will change. So oh, okay. the the only only two of the factors are getting criterion scores, but the overall impact score still ranges from one to nine, and they don't really expect a big shift in that. So. I mean, be okay. keeping track of that, but don't. No. The lower half is the lower half. <laughs> so just to clarify, the I, I guess the way the the total score is when you take all five right scores, and now you just have two scores. Well, right, but but even now, there's no mathematical formula for coming up with the overall impact score from the criterion scores. That is assigned separately, and reviewers can weigh the different criteria in any way they want. And that will still be the same. So reviewers can still weigh the factors however they want in arriving at their overall impact score. I would say it's a change for the better. We'll find out. Tim. <laughs> what would be an example of an inadequate researcher or environment? Well, I mean, if, if somebody has a research plan and they clearly don't have somebody on their team who can do part of the research that they are proposing, then that would be gaps identified. Um, and you would write down that they clearly need you know, somebody who can turn on a computer or whatever it is that they're missing. So that's score driving and the overall score in the end. Yes, yes, it, it is factored in the overall score. It won't receive a criterion score, again, to try to de-emphasize that is, is really a binary choice. But it, if gaps are identified, yes, then it should be factored into the overall score. I'm just trying to understand, like, are these, like, tiny gaps, big gaps? Like, That's, that yeah, is up I've, to the reviewer. Okay. Uh, if it right. seriously impacts the project, then it's a big gap. Uh, so that says language seriously impacts. Uh, sorry? Is that, it, maybe I missed that. That was the language seriously impacts. That was the I mean, did, you yeah. could, it, it can be factored in the overall sc score however you want. But if you think that the gap is serious enough that they can't complete the project, then yes, you can, it would, it would seriously affect the overall impact score. But if it's something that they could address by adding somebody at 1% effort, then that's. That, that's not. what I'm getting at. Like, we're, right. okay. Yeah. So that, will there be guidance on that, like on what that threshold um, should there's, be? There's going to be reviewer training okay. coming out in the spring. Um, so hopefully there will be more detailed guidance on that okay. then. Thanks. Okay, stay tuned. Thank you, Sarah. 